in today's episode i get on conversation with the nine time crossfit world champion a record and an incredible achievement she is considered as the fittest woman on earth and the world's fittest mother a true rock star i'm joined by kara sounders a truly inspiring figure for everyone and especially women all over the globe we talk about her journey into the crossfit world what inspires her and uncover the preparations an athlete has to undergo to achieve world's biggest laurels kara is at her motivational and inspiring best on this segment let's get into it thanks a ton uh, kara for being here and doing this uh, really appreciate you taking time out uh, out of a busy schedule but um, first of all um, really really excited to know how did you get here like i mean um, from like what really excited to know about your life story like what actually happened in your life that actually charted you on this path it's a bit of a funny story actually um you know people always ask me how i became a professional athlete and how i'm doing what i'm doing you know did i set out to be a professional athlete and to be honest it was all a little bit of an accident so i finished school i was looking for, i wasn't sure what i wanted to do when i finished high school um i thought about so many different avenues um and couldn't quite figure out what to do so i decided to have a little bit of a gap year and just work until i figured out what i wanted to do and at the last minute all of my friends were going to uni and everything and i kind of panicked and i was like i don't want to have a gap year i'm going to miss out i need to go and do something so i actually started st- studying accounting and i did that for 12 months and then i was like no i should have had my break i do not want to do accounting <laughs> um i was doing well at it but just didn't enjoy it and then uh so i took the time that i was going to take i worked and you know just kind of like lived life a little bit after being in school for a while and um i was still trying to figure out what i wanted to do and uh i my mom sort of had me write down a list of all of the things that i was really interested in and i started studying nutritional medicine and that was like a huge passion for me natural health and like holistic health and you know um essentially like nurturing your own body to support itself was something i was really passionate about from a really young age and i loved exercise and all of those kind of things so i was studying that and um i joined a gym i started exercising and i absolutely loved it i fell in love someone introduced me to crossfit and i was like this is the most fun i've ever had and then i just turned up every day because i just loved that it made me feel good um when i sort of was lacking a little bit of purpose in my life and i wasn't really too sure what i wanted to do so i started exercising doing crossfit and i got quite good at it quite quickly and i actually ended up leaving uni and just competing i sort of accidentally qualified for a competition and i i toyed with the idea for a little while and for some reason at that moment in time it just felt right to keep going down that path of being an athlete so i followed that and then i was kind of always remained uh, like i guess a student and kind of studying nutrition and health like on the side more for my own personal benefit and you know for like my friends and family and everything like that around me and you know here we are like that was in that that journey probably started you know like i started crossfit in 2011 so it's been 10 years now of doing that still training really hard you know still super passionate about health um but just not on like a not a direct professional level i guess yeah 10 years sounds like a lifetime especially in a sport that's that's actually pretty intense right i come from brazilian jiu jitsu and uh, when we used to think about uh, different types of uh, cross training the one that we were like genuinely scared of was actually crossfit because uh, and i'm saying this honestly because when we look at different other training mechanisms and uh, protocols the the crossfit folks were like extremists in in our opinion uh, back then like uh, pushing all the boundaries and uh, and we used to think that oh we are really killing it uh, by uh, sparring for like 5 6 7 hours but then when we do one hour of uh, crossfit training the the amount of um, talent energy and uh, i i think motivation it takes is just another level so my my co-founder vatsal uh, he's actually a crossfit fan i i i admire crossfit a, a lot but uh, uh, i i didn't enjoy it as much in the earlier days uh, but uh, it's it's really inspiring to see uh, uh, such a long career in crossfit 
right? Uh, it's 10 years is almost like a lifetime. And a lot of, I think, uh, as people are getting educated about CrossFit and uh, similar other formats, I think people are now being able to differentiate in some ways between that CrossFit is not is not bodybuilding, right? And it's I know it's such a lame comparison, but I think for, for the listener's benefit, what are some of the things that are actually different when you go to a gym, you're presented with a... Uh, with an opportunity to actually train and do resistance training or weight training. But then uh, you chose CrossFit. So what was some of the aspects of CrossFit that really like appealed to you? I think the main thing for me was I'd been doing exercise at a regular gym and, um, you know, I'd run and, you know, maybe lift a few weights here and there. And it, I just found that it was really hard to maintain because I found it boring. And I was like, if I'm going to do something that's really hard, And, you know, because turning up to the gym or exercising in general is hard because you have to put yourself in a really uncomfortable position. You have to like stress your body a little bit in order to get better and to become more resilient. And so in order to do that, I needed something that was going to entertain me to a degree. And I think you have to find something that you just like really genuinely enjoy. And for me, that was CrossFit because it had so much variance. It was, you know, I could do something really aerobic, like super basic like running or riding or rowing one day and then I could lift heavy weights and I could lift with technical lifts like the Olympic lift so I had to really use my brain at the same time to like coordinate how to move well and then same thing for like a high skill component like gymnastics I had to I I really had to think while I was doing it as well as working really hard and you know, a lot of people will say with CrossFit is that you just feel like you can never master it. So you're constantly just chasing and always getting better. You're forever getting better, but um, you're never the best. And there's always something different to work on. And I think that just satisfies for me, like that deep need to be learning. Like I really like to learn and I think people genuinely like to learn and evolve. And um, so that to this day, 10 years later, it's still like I'm a professional athlete in that space. And there is still so much I'm learning. There's still so much I'm working on that I still haven't been able to master. And it just, but there's enough variance to kind of keep me going for a really, really long time. So, yeah. Well, that's really interesting because if you're a coach, you're training as well and you're actually performing, you're competing. I think it's very different from just practicing uh, like one sport in its own way, essentially. Right. Because uh, coaching is a different aspect and performing is a different aspect. And um, there are nuances to each of these. Right. So compared to, let's say, if I'm training CrossFit and if I'm competing, uh, of course, the level obviously goes up uh, significantly. But uh, is there an aspect of uh, mental strength and uh, also looking at uh, uh, things like nutrition is in a precise way uh, when you start competing versus when you just start training? Yeah, 100%. I think um, I always tell people that the thing I've learned the most in CrossFit is not necessarily like the skills and, you know, like the fitness, but it's learning how to like be resilient and kind of push through. And I've learned all of these different kind of mental tools and health tools. And, you know, like, it's funny, I tell people these days, like, you know, I really pride myself on my health. And, you know, a lot of people kind of just assume, oh, just because she works out that she's health, that like, she thinks she's healthy. I'm like, no, what I had to learn was that there are so many different components to obviously being a professional athlete, but also just to get the most out of your workout and obviously to be able to like live your best days and feel your healthiest. Like there is so much to mindset and that's something that can't just be told and learned overnight. It's constant little efforts and constant failures, right? Like the thing for me is in a sport where – I'm competing and where I'm doing so many different challenging movements, I fail more times than I succeed. So you have to learn to actually take those failures in your stride constantly every single day and know that's a part of the process. And over time, you start to really see how beneficial that is and you start to become so resilient, so able to cope with that failure because you know that that success is coming eventually and it's so much sweeter. So that mental side of it is definitely learned and practiced over a really long time. Um, and I've read books and talked to, you know, mental uh, like sports psychologists and things like that to try and help with different tools. Um, and I've kind of got like a whole heap of tools that I just draw upon as I need. 
And then with everything else, like to perform or to compete, to train well and just be able to show up and get a good workout, like I've had to learn all the other things that I have to master. You know, you have to take care of your body. You have to take care of your mind. You know, you have to get rest. Like all of those things are a huge component of the workout itself. Like we always joke around saying that, you know, like it's everything that you do outside of the session that that actually makes you great, you know, that actually makes that session worthwhile. Because there's, if I go into a session and I've had zero sleep and I ate junk food the day before, like all day long, then I can't actually really hit a maximum and I can't really push my limits in training at all. So um, along the way, I've just been doing research, talking to people, listening to people, um, you know, finding new ways that I can be 1% better each year, you know, each season, all of the little things that I can dial in to just be the best that I can be. That's really interesting. It almost feels like apart from being a physical experience, it's also an academic experience, right? And uh, there's a lot of component of research that actually goes into it. There's a lot of research actually that goes into it that you have to do yourself. Uh, it's it doesn't come in a pill it doesn't come in a platter uh, presented to you right uh, and because that's also because everybody is extremely unique so that's that's really interesting to know that what you're really saying is that it's not only the time in the gym it's the time outside the gym as well that really counts uh, when you want to keep performing consistently yeah uh, consistency is the keyword here and for that uh, focusing on or understanding how your nutrition works Uh, and how your recovery works are probably like or maybe your sleep as well right are like deep areas of focus so on that it's really interesting like there is a lot around uh, exercise protocols uh, recovery protocols but particularly out of the mix nutrition seems extremely confusing and i say that because over the last 10 years every few months or maybe every few years there's always been a wave in nutrition around oh this is good and this is bad oh this is uh, you should what you, you should be eating and this is a magical uh, thing that will change your life or this is a magical diet and everything else is bad so particularly in nutrition this is really interesting to see because like if you look at exercise yes this also evolves in exercise and people have their opinions but uh, in nutrition it almost seems like it's very extremist right um that uh, if somebody is doing a keto diet and you tell them that hey this is isn't sustainable we almost like picking up a fight how do you view that and uh, maybe also in the context with how are some of the new technologies that are emerging around uh, demystifying this yeah like i think the thing with nutrition is there definitely are so many different things coming up all the time and i think the reason people kind of get a little bit um yeah they kind of get a little bit crazy about it sometimes is that it's a, it's a really emotional attachment when it comes to food you know a lot of people do um they link their food to either their emotions or to how they feel and view like feel about and view themselves so a lot of people you know they're looking for this kind of magic way to feel good to feel confident to feel you know um like they like themselves and so because it also has that impact on like how you look and how you carry yourself through your day i think it can get pretty emotional for some people and they you know everyone gets this sense of desperation at times where they're looking for something to just to fix them to make them feel great um you know and i think that there's a couple of different aspects to like how i view nutrition and the main thing is that it's a little bit different for everyone there's certain things that like we're that are always the same because we're all human beings. So we have very similar biology, we work in a certain way. Um so there's certain principles that are obviously going to apply and then you have to get to know yourself and understand how your individual body works, right? Like what's your cultural background, you know, what did your ancestors eat? How did they live their life? And then what kind of genetics were passed through to you and how your body functions? You know, like how, you know, how were you fed as a child like all of these different things contribute to obviously who we are and it's so so individual there's just no copy and paste that you can just do for everyone um i firmly believe in real nutrition first so like always clean real food like stay away from processed things as much as you can so there's that like really holistic side of me that really likes to nurture 
you know, nurture the gut, nurture your body and how it functions on, 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 on a daily normal holistic level. And then there's that sort of like calculated approach where you start looking at other aspects to like, you know, and this is the, the science that comes in. So you've got like the nature and science that work hand in hand, you know, they can be best friends. They don't necessarily need to be enemies. So we have the nature, we were given all of these amazing things. And then we've done research to figure out how we can kind of make those work and how that can work for you individually. And, um, you know, obviously we have all of these different tools now and different ways that we can then measure how our body is responding to those different nutritional practices. And that's obviously going to be so different. You know, how I uptake glucose might be totally different than how my husband does because he's a male, I'm a female. We were raised in different homes with different genetics, all of those different types of things. Um, And so, like, we're in this space now where we do have the opportunity to actually see how our bodies are working on an individual basis and you can get that understanding of your own biochemistry which is really really cool um and obviously can help you sort of take it to the next level i think it's you've got to try and block out a lot of the noise when it comes to like diets and and crazy things like that um i follow a um like an accredited dietitian And uh, she said, you know, she'll do a lot of research. She might spend like 50 to 60 hours researching a particular nutrient or um, a particular food or whatever. And she'll find all of this research and she'll get really, really excited about it and think, you know, for, for a week, she'll be like, this one thing can solve the world's problems and it will do all of these things. She said she never puts that forward. She'll always wait and sit on that information until she's not as excited anymore and then figure out how that can be integrated into a regular person's life without creating this this feeling that like there's always this one thing or this new thing, this new superfood or a new, you know, diet, keto or high carb, low carb, whatever it is. Um, and so I think it's just taking that time and just understanding the fundamentals, get some information about yourself and then always bring it back to sort of the amount of real good natural whole foods. And I think that's how I've learned to do it. Um, incorporating more of the science more now in the later stage of my career. I always ate well, like good food, but now I work a little bit more with calculated timing and quantities. And that's what enables me to sort of perform and function at higher levels when I require more from my body. That's really interesting. The the most interesting part for me was when you mentioned that uh, nature and science uh, can actually be good, can actually be uh, best friends. And uh, that's very rare to hear because uh, you almost see a tussle uh, between uh, folks at natural medicine or uh, essentially like the modern medicine. And uh, it almost seems like one is one is saying that, oh, the other one doesn't work. But I think it's, it's a really interesting perspective that if they are best friends, if they work together in tandem, that is actually pretty powerful. And also the fact that nutrition forming core principles like eating whole foods it's actually pretty convenient compared to, let's say, uh, defining that, oh, I will not eat these macros, but I will eat the other ones because we actually have a fair distribution of macros all around us, right? Uh, it's it's nature, essentially, right? I mean, nature has given us access to all types of macros and saying no to one sort of like uh, puts everything in, in imbalance uh, in many ways. So that seems really, really interesting. And you also mentioned a little bit about um, precision uh, nutrition here, right? What are some of the ways in which do you see uh, precision nutrition is actually evolving or uh, some methods or some new technologies and tools that are, that are actually demystifying this and making it easier? Oh, there's so many things, right? Like, you know, it started with simple basic apps on like, you know, tracking your food, tracking your nutrition and um, you know, that, that was sort of probably the foundation of it, um, was actually figuring out, following along with apps and things like that to see what's actually in your food, right? Because a lot of people don't actually even know what's in it to start off with, um, how much you're consuming of, the, of what things at certain times. And then obviously now there's other ways that you can obviously track, um, I guess, track your biomarkers, you know, like you've got all kinds of wearables for different things, you know, for your heart rate or whatever it is. And then obviously now, um, you know, we've been working with tracking glucose as something totally new, which is obviously being used for other purposes for a a long time now, but it's now being explored in, you know, other people outside of 
particular medical conditions to actually see how their body is responding, which um, is like crazy and awesome, I guess, to be like accessible to regular people and maybe people who don't actually even know just so that we can see it because having something there that you can see gives you that direct feedback to actually take action, you know, but if you don't know, if you can't see it, you don't know. Right. Um, and not a lot of people know what sort of like feeling to go off. And it's definitely still a new space for me. Um, you know, like obviously people are like measuring, you know, their oxygen levels and all of these kind of things. Like there's a whole nother world. I'm sure a lot of things that I don't even know about. Um, like some crazy scientific things that, you know, and probably big, big sporting teams and things like that. Um, but it's definitely working its way down into like more of an accessible level to be able to see what your body is actually telling you. Yeah, I, I think this industry is in the right direction uh, overall, given the fact that like there is so much of noise on one side that uh, as a counter force, this space is actually looking for things that are from scratch and uh, that are more objective, more number driven, all of these things. This frequency of change in this space, which is a little confusing, might actually get structured over the next few uh, years uh, in terms of uh, people having access to methods like you mentioned biomarkers like glucose. And there are so many biomarkers that are sort of being now ma being made available. Uh, unfortunately, I think from a wearable form factor perspective, we only have a few. There is HRV, there is glucose, there is resisting heart rate, sleep, skin temperature. We are working on some of these. Yeah, I think I even, um, I've tested, there's like urine samples that you can do now to check like inflammation and things like that. Like a couple of sort of basic things that are sort of popping up around the place, but not, yeah, not too many. There's just sort of like a few in, or like one in, in each category. Yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. And you might, you might see that there are, there's one class of variables or tests that are static in nature. Like you do a blood test every quarter or every month, maybe. Or uh, you might actually do a microbiome test in this case. But then there are a few that are real time in nature. Like basically you wear them, you measure your behavior against these uh, markers on a real time basis. So is there a difference between these two in terms of how they actually work for you? Yeah, well, I think the one main thing um, is time, right? So like actually taking the time to get these markers. So something like going and getting a blood test is not, it's not as calculated. You can't do it every single day and then constantly get that feedback, you know, go and get a blood test, wait for the results to come back. It's, it's something a little bit more in depth. So some of those things aren't, aren't as realistic on a regular basis, right? Like you can go and test some of those markers, but, um, to do it regularly is a little bit tricky. So I think anything that you can have that, is with you in your home or in your day-to-day -day life, like that's always going to be the most beneficial. And especially when people are time poor um, and they can get that sort of direct constant feedback. Otherwise it ends up just being one of those things that just slips to the side and, you know, like gets forgotten about and doesn't get done. And then people don't sort of pay any attention to it, um, which is why I think the things that have the most benefits are the things that are just more accessible and can come to you. They can be wherever you are, like things that can be connected to your device or whatever it may be um, is, yeah, is probably the most important thing as to something that's a little bit more direct. And then, you know, anything that's going to give you direct feedback for things that you're doing constantly all day long. So say, for instance, like if you have something that's going to track a marker, like say the glucose, for instance, you're going to eat several times a day, like maybe like minimum three times, maybe six, maybe eight, who knows if you're like snacking throughout the day. So you can get that constant feedback at different times, um, which is like, you know, there's certain sleep trackers and things like that that are actually going to track you and track your respiratory rate and things like that all through the night. So something that's a little bit more frequent is obviously going to give you the most accurate data. No, it's it's actually, yeah, you're right. It's, uh, it's less friction. So... Um... Whenever there is less friction, there's higher frequency, right? Because there's less effort involved. But that's really interesting because as this space is evolving, I think we'll we'll probably see more and more focus on making it easier for people. Most people are like, I think, lazy by default because the world is becoming a more comfortable place. But I think for people to 
make change if thermodynamically it becomes easier there's less energy uh, involved in in making that change i think it it sort of like makes or includes millions of other people who are just on the verge and then even something that say like if it's something that you can have in your home and you can use regularly and there is less friction you can also do it with other people because you know you can kind of link up and you can get groups together who are doing the same kind of thing whereas some of your old school sort of testing that's less frequent it's a very like it's a lonely process it's something you kind of just do on your own whereas like you can kind of create challenges and healthy habits with a friend or family member or something like that if you do have it in your home and you can kind of get everyone involved which makes it a little bit easier to you know not be so lazy which like you said we just are by default because things are a bit easy like I know myself it's you know just it's hard sometimes just keeping things charged you know (laughs) just making sure that you've got all of those kind of things so um, the more accessible and the more normal that it can just integrate into your daily routine is always going to be more beneficial because you're just going to see it more and you're going to have it there like it's normal and it gives you something to to work off constantly yeah that that's really really interesting and uh, one of the things that you also mentioned in this is the fact that you you work maybe you work out with your own protocol but then uh, nutrition is something that is almost always with the family right um that's why it's different because uh, when you plan uh, your journey uh, it's very hard to plan it in an alien way it's always inclusive and uh, I think in context of the fact that uh, you have been recognized as uh, the world's fittest mother and uh, I think that's that itself is really re- unique about you because uh, it's not just about the fact that uh, you've been training performing coaching people but as a mother as well I think you have been able to do these things and that's really remarkable uh, for like millions and millions of mothers globally saying that they they're able to actually uh, that they're able to see you perform and live the life the way you want and achieve what you want but on that when when you see it from a mother's perspective and when you see nutrition like you saw, you actually explain from your perspective as well right that it's confusing but then then you have defined some principles how does it change when it comes to a when it comes to your kid essentially in this case like some of these principles and how do you think about it really right because what we have been seeing is that the problem obviously exists in our food supply chain and the way we look at food and processed foods and the inclusion of sugar in our everyday diet etc right but when it comes to kids it's a little tricky and uh, so how how do you how do you actually see that that's really interesting to hear yeah i think um i mean the benefit that i had obviously was like i had educated myself on nutrition for a really long time before i had my daughter so it was such a normal way of life for me being an athlete and just someone who was really passionate about it and um i remember when i started studying nutrition my grandfather said to me like no, it will never be a waste of time whether you work in that field or you don't work in that field. He said, it's knowledge that you will have for your entire life that will forever benefit you and your family. And that's stuck with me forever. And it's been so true. Like members of my family know that they can come to me and I can help them out and give them tips and advice on how to live a healthier life. And so from being pregnant to then having my daughter and now raising her, you know, she's a toddler now. Um, it was so important to me that her foundation was so healthy and that nutrition was such a huge part of our life and something that I've always dedicated um, more time and energy to than some other things. You know, I'll probably be the mom that forgets to pack her shoes when she's got to go somewhere, but I'll always remember that she's had good food and make sure that she's had good nutrition, right? Um, And I think that that's so, so important. And for me, I started that from a very, very early age, from the minute she was born, you know, like, and as soon as she was exposed to foods, it's always been good food. It's never been junk food. Um, I always get her as soon as she was at an age where she could see and look around, I get her in the kitchen with me and get her identifying different foods and holding them and tasting them and feeling their texture and seeing where they go. They go in the oven and how that all plays out. And And I have her be so involved in everything that I do. So at the moment, at two and a half years old, that's all she knows. So sure, she gets a little, you know, they get difficult and sometimes they don't want to eat certain things and that's fine. But, you know, someone once said, you know, the the parent is responsible for what is on the plate in front of the child and then the child is responsible for how much of that they eat. So 
you know, I'm not going to pressure her to like eat a certain amount or whatever. If she's hungry, she's hungry. But what she sees on her plate is always going to have good nutritional value. Um, and it's always going to help her in her life. And I truly believe that that will set her up, you know, to have, you know, not have crazy mood swings, to be able to sleep well. You know, people go, how does she, How does your child sleep so well? I'm like, well, that's a huge part of it. She exercises with us. You know, she's always physically active. She always eats good food. You know, that's that's her normal. She doesn't know anything else. So by doing it early, it makes it a lot easier later because that's all they've ever known. And, um, you know, I will make it a huge priority. And I put a lot of time and effort into preparing food and snacks and always having our own food packed and things like that. Um, and it's, it's one of the things I think I'm most proud of. And the thing that I think has had the most value in like raising a small person and having them like be happy and good and, you know, flourishing. So, um, yeah, I, I think my only would advice is to, do it early. And the, and the thing for me too, right, is I prioritize that for myself because being pregnant and having a child is really hard. So not nourishing yourself properly is only going to make it harder. You know, like you can go, I'm feeling really tired and exhausted. You know, my child's been up all night. So then going and eating crazy high sugar foods, processed foods, you know, alcohol in abundance or whatever it may be is only going to make that worse. And I don't want to feel any worse. I want to feel as good as possible so that I'm like happy and my mood is regulated and I can then be that good example to my child. So um, that's always been how I viewed it. And you still feel tired. It's still hard, but it's it's definitely a lot easier, I think, than it could be. Yeah. No, I think two really interesting uh, uh, pearls of wisdom, I think, right? One is... Uh, the fact that uh, you mentioned that uh, nutrition is or the nutrition science is actually for life. It's not really only a, a business that you get into or uh, it's not only um, something that you study for uh, uh, making more money or uh, doing like basically uh, as, as work, right? It's, it's actually for life. It's something that that's a phenomenal principle that it's additive in your life's experience. And the other one, uh, it's a really nice one as well. The the fact that you're responsible for for putting the food on the table, uh, the, the type of food, and then the kid is responsible for the quantity or how much they want to eat. Uh, that's a really nice principle because uh, uh, when you look at the food supply chain problems and it goes down, it starts from where it's made or where it's farmed essentially to where it's actually put on the table. I don't think we can immediately solve the, the supply chain problem of where it is farmed, but we can actually solve at least the, the problem of selection, which is at our table. At our table, we can make better decision, better choices. This is, this is great. This is, whole, this is whole food. This is, this is more natural. This is a much better way to enjoy food versus essentially sort of like uh, saying that, okay, this is, uh, this is more convenient. But that's really interesting. It, it it does take in a lot of effort, I feel, to actually get here. It it does take a little bit of effort, but it's also, in my eyes, I think it's the single easiest thing you can do to feel a thousand times better straight away. You don't need to go out and do anything crazy. Just when you when you buy your food, you just buy better choices, right? You make better choices in what you bring into your home. And you can instantly, after one day, you can feel better because, like I said, you're going to eat three to six, maybe eight times a day. And so every single opportunity, like every single time you put something in your mouth is an opportunity to feel better or worse. So, um, you know, it is. it takes a little bit at the start just to get used to it. And then I still think it's a thousand times easier. You don't have to go see anyone to do it. You know, you don't need any, you don't have to pay a lot of money to do it. You just have to make a better choice at the time, bring the right things into your home. And then it can still be really basic, right? Like it doesn't have to be elaborate. Good nutrition doesn't have to need, like doesn't need to be crazy elaborate food. It's just simple um, and yeah, just simple, good, real food. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really cool. Uh, it simplifies a lot of things. And uh, given that there's so much confusion and uh, there's so much of, uh, you can say, uh, there's so many preferences that people have, just having a basic principle, a set of basic principles around uh, what you eat 
uh, can be really interesting. Uh, with that, I think we're almost at the, uh, the far end uh, of, the, of the session. I think uh, one question that all of us had was that, you're, because you're also a coach, what would be the top three things that you could actually tell a beginner across everything, like basically training, nutrition, uh, let's say recovery, what would be those top three uh, principles that if you just had like five minutes with an individual, what would you tell them to do? I'd say number one is consistency is the most important thing. So it doesn't matter if you have a lot of energy or a little, little energy that day or whether you want to or you don't want to, consistency is the key. So just show up, put your foot in the door, whatever that looks like for the day. It's a little bit different every day. Just show up with whatever you have at the time and those little efforts will become a habit and it will make the whole in, entire journey more enjoyable and make it a lot easier. So, you know, doing two big crazy workouts per week that go for four hours is not as beneficial as you're showing up for 15 minutes each day for yourself. Um, so it should be a daily practice, whether that's your nutrition um, or your exercise or whatever it is that you do for yourself, something that you contribute to your health should be a consistent habit every single day. Um, I would also say start super slow when it comes to both exercise and nutrition. So again, no big crazy changes. I wouldn't go from one day eating your standard diet to going 100% keto the next day. I think it's you're more likely to become overwhelmed or burnt out or you feel like you're missing out and then so you're more likely to go backwards. The best thing that I've ever done and the healthiest I am now at 32 years old and 10 years into my athletic career and after having a child, I'm the healthiest I've ever been in my life, but it's been a slow evolution every single year, adding in one little thing at a time, removing this here, adding this in there and being more consistent. It's been a really, really slow process. So it's always been enjoyable just to get a little bit more healthy instead of, um, you know, a real stress or a real pain or a burden. So consistency, take it super slow. Do less so that it's always a win. Don't You don't want to go backwards. So every day should be like, that's a win. I was just a little bit better and a little bit better. Um, and then the third thing I would say is work with who you are and what you love. So when I'm telling someone about nutrition, for instance, don't eat how the person next to you is eating you know, write down all of your favorite foods, maybe some foods that you eat in your culture that, you know, you really can't live without, that, you know, they, they're they good for your soul. You know, write those down, educate yourself on what is in those foods and then work them into a particular quantity. And then say, for instance, you know, you have a, you're Italian and you have this like beautiful big dish that's like, you know, maybe super high calories or like maybe has, you know, more carbohydrates or whatever that you need, figure out an appropriate portion size and a day of the week that you're going to have it. So don't remove those things that are really important and that you really love and that are good for you as well. And then same goes for exercise. Find something that you genuinely love and don't just do something that's like on trend or that everyone else is doing. Some people love CrossFit. I love CrossFit because I love doing intense things and lifting heavy and I love the crazy differences. But some people are a lot more placid and they really enjoy doing yoga or Pilates or running or whatever it is. There's no right or wrong answer um, other than doing something that you don't love or that, you know, isn't sort of true to you. So it's a lot easier to stick to good habits if you can find something that you enjoy more. Um, in saying that, it'll still all be hard at the start, but hard is not bad. Hard is just hard. So um, just always remember that that that's a great takeaway hard is just hard and uh, <laughs> that's really cool uh, thanks a ton uh, uh, Kara for for this uh, uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, really appreciate you taking time out and uh, yeah uh, there's so many principles I took away uh, personally as well uh, from this conversation and uh, hope our listeners too so thank you for all of this I hope you got valuable insights into the physical and mental conditioning that an athlete has to go under to achieve things at the very top level. 
what part of kara's life journey were you most inspired by do let us know by tagging at human hq on twitter and instagram as always share this podcast with your near and dear ones and introduce a new spectrum of inspiration and motivation in their lives see you soon with the next one